A boom of thunder. Darkness. A scream. And then... The place was called the West Mansion. But, to all who knew its legend, it was known as Splatterhouse. It was once the home of the famed parapsychologist Dr. West. There was a research lab in the house where Dr. West conducted some of his most gruesome experiments. It was even said that it was in this house that he created the most hideous creatures that ever walked the face of the Earth. But no one knew for sure Dr. West had not been seen or heard <laughs> seen or heard from in years, and no one who has ever gone into the mansion has lived to tell the tale. Rick and his girlfriend, Jennifer, were parapsychology majors at the local university. They were both very interested in the works of Dr. West, as he was the most famed parapsychologist in the world. Although he had not been seen or heard from anyone in years. Anyway. One day, they decided to visit the abandoned West Mansion as part of a project they were working on in school. As they walked towards the house, it started to rain. They entered. All went dark. Lightning cracked through the sky. There was a frantic scuffle, then a scream, and suddenly Jennifer was gone. Rick's unconscious body was covered with blood. Not dead, just sleeping. Rated T for teen. Hours later, Rick awoke to a fantastic horror. He was alone and drenched with blood. But the most horrifying thing of all was that a hideous mask covered his face. He had read tales of this terror mask in Dr. West's writing. It was said to have ancient spiritual powers. As his only hope, Rick must, Rick must depend on this mask to give him the strength and courage to find a Jennifer. Now, Rick's fight has begun. Truly, it was never a horrifying mask to begin with, a terrifying mask indeed. Let's see how terrifying it truly is. As we begin, Splatterhouse. As I've never played it before, Um, how do I get out of the, uh, sound test here? Surely it can't be that hard. There it is. Splatterhouse! Or the Turbo Graphics. No spoilers yet. This one was apparently released in 1990, where the arcade original, 1988. No small figures approaching the house, no scream of anguish. Not much of anything, quite frankly. Just a house, gently flashing in the distance. But now, once we're inside, we recognize that it is the Splatter House. And there's our Terror Mask. Purplish red. It honestly looks pretty cool. But this is a form of censorship. This is explicit censorship. Much of the game is rumored to have been censored on the TurboGrafx port. But it is mostly believed that it is technical limitations that caused a great deal of the changes between this version and the much more gruesome arcade version. Let's just get out of here and take no damage on the boss. getting this beaten up in the first level of Splatterhouse. It might be a little bit rusty. On the bright side, the TurboGrafx version is a bit easier than the arcade version. 
so I do stand a chance. Not a great chance. But we'll make something happen. I have a few tricks up my sleeve. They're not technically cheats. But sort of. I did it. Love these little screen transitions. And we recover 2 HP anytime we complete a level. Ooh, enemies that take two hits. Unless you have a stick. Then they're done for. Wrench, also. Quick kill. Hanging desiccated corpses. The Splatterhouse has seen better days. Our open house event is not going well. I don't think Rick and Jennifer will be buying. But first they gotta survive. Now the most stressful music in the game. For no good reason. This is an easy segment. But the sewer levels have been deemed terrifying enough to warrant music that gradually speeds up. It will eventually reach a fever pitch. Yeah, definitely no censorship here. Pretty much all the sprites were redrawn, but they are as close to identical as their extremely detailed arcade uh, equivalents. Oh, also, I could have just sat there at the bottom of the uh, ladder. Nothing would have happened. Jump the gun a little there. There are no time limits on any screens in this version of the game. Whereas... Arcade version, there are time limits on every screen. Oh, I got impaled by a knife. Gruesome. Can't believe I forgot that it begins with scripted garbage raining from the sky. In random locations. Okay, maybe not. It seemed like it was falling in different spots the second time. I don't believe the locations are actually randomized. Just that my memory is poor. In the short term. Fortunately, I first played this game very, very thoroughly nearly a decade ago. So it is well within my long-term memory at this point. I remember this. Down comes the chandelier, and if you're underneath it, you die, and gotta do the whole boss fight again. On to... the dog hunt. Technically, we're gonna want to duck and kick everybody. Shotgun shells are at a premium. Dodge the hands that we can't even tell our hands at the moment. Legitimately didn't know if the green guys could go through the spike pit. So we're just going to blast our way through everybody now. So there's a backup shotgun right here. And we can juggle them into the next area. Where Biggie Man awaits. A legendary monster design. So good. And his reach is just baffling. You don't really stand a chance in a fair fight. What you want to do is empty a shotgun into him. Then... Get him with a uh, slide attack. 
Oh, everything here is taking so many hits. And you can't really stack hits if there are two enemies stacked up on top of each other. Only one of them will be injured when you swing. Seems to be a weird technical limitation more than anything else. Punch him away from my shotgun. He is far enough away. Oh! This guy's good. It's our first game over, and there are limited continues. And as far as I know, there's no way to replenish your continues. Whatever. Dog can chow down. Not this one, though. This one must pay. There's a little punishment sewer level if we were to fall down there. By fall, I mean get grabbed and pulled into the abyss. And here is Biggie Man. There he is. He is big. And he is presumably a man underneath all that burlap. There. That'll do. Not quite a slide attack, but he was locked in place for the duration of my foot assault. Such a just unbelievably great monster design, and you see it for such a brief period of time. That red sludge monster was supposed to be in the last level, but they cut it out of this version. And I don't know why. Oh, I'm going into the basement. This is actually for the best, because I did not show off this basement path in my Let's Play years ago. There's a near-identical portion of a level later on, which I did intend to show off, so I skipped this little area. But I couldn't deprive you of all this hot boar worm action. Let's get out of here. Yeah, I've never showed off the Turbo Graphics version. And I'm frankly a little disappointed that the 2010 remake did not include the Turbo Graphics version in its classics section. As I mean, it only takes up like 20 megs the whole game. Why not throw it in? And they left out uh, One Paco Graffiti, which is one of my favorite Splatterhouse games. They did that on purpose, because they didn't want a joke game in their deadly serious Splatterhouse. They thought it would, uh, confuse players. And it probably would. It's a confusing game. But it is relevant and necessary for the Splatterhouse experience. The TurboGrafx version, in my opinion, has plenty enough differences warrant inclusion as well. Play a little hopscotch. And just walk out the room. What is the point of those lawnmower blades? Baffling. Dr. West just wanted to chop up his poor zombies didn't know any better than to walk right into Spitting Blades. We didn't see any Red Sludge Monster there, either. I think if you stay on the upper path, you will see a Sludge Monster. Anyway, here's Blue Mask Ricks. They want to fight me. They take three hits to kill. If you do a jumping attack, you can hit them with your foot. Then again on your way down, like that, get a double hit. Their iframes are significantly worse than legitimate Ricks. Blue offers very brief periods of invulnerability, whilst red lets you be invincible all day long. Actually, our iframes are pretty terrible. And we can also get double hit by some monsters. If we're not careful.
This fight can be really irritating, and it is explicitly censored. Unlike a lot of this game, just being technical limitations. This is supposed to be a cross we're fighting. My cleaver is just slightly off screen. So my odds of success are minimal. But not impossible. Oh, I got chased by a head. A deadly head. So I think the creepy ghost face, surrounded by cheap rubber Halloween masks, is actually cooler than the cross surrounded by cheap rubber Halloween masks. I kind of like the censored version better. Maybe that's just me. I'm not showing the uncensored version, so... You'll have to look it up yourself if you want to be the judge. Got an extra life. So we have the five continues, three lives, and five hits per life. The rubber masks are barely entering the screen, so that was a abnormally safe attempt at that boss. And now, it's Rick's wedding. And the priest is no-show. As is the altar. The altar had a cross on it, so they just removed the whole damn thing. Now they're just floating candles. Very awkward choice. Jennifer is supposed to scream there, but uh, she didn't, because Turbographic sound chip couldn't quite handle it. So, we don't really know why we're moving on to the next level, or what that dramatic sting was all about. But hey, found some chairs. They were a boss, long ago. Now we must smash a dozen of them. The priest was the floating head. Indeed. It's our own fault we couldn't get married. We crushed the priest. This is also a good character to get double hits on. Or any hits. So I don't, uh... get brutalized within an inch of my life. Like... Okay, he jumped back. And I got impaled by his severed head. I think I ran away from the first instance of the big head enemies. These floors are ridiculously slippery. Even the ones that aren't slanted. You can keep your momentum on them, even if you are not touching the D-pad. Their behavior is very strange right now, actually. Typically, they are much more predictable, but these ones are jumping all over the place. So I'm going to show you the most interesting series of paths here. You can have a bunch of branches. We can go down or up. First up is more interesting. The hands did give you the middle finger in the arcade version. but it barely looked like that. See, the game can actually manage screams. They're not the most convincing screams, but they are screams. Jumping down this hole would put us on the bottom path, which I don't want to go on there. But I do want to go on here. As the upper path leads to another hall of mirrors. Whereas this leads to a pit of zombies. Unique zombies that you can't see anywhere else in the game. So we want to fight the Pumpkinhead Man. His voice clip has been removed. Got overwhelmed by zombies. The Ghouler, yes. The Ghouler deserves to get a successful kill on me. Iconic character that he is. So-called because that's what his voice clip sounds like in the arcade version, but he has no voice clip here.
show off how to do this room successfully. If you delay slightly, then this guy will always jump towards you. And pinball his head, and I'm absolutely not showing how to do this room successfully. This is about as unsuccessful as you can be. And off goes that guy. <laughs> Tragic. We're still on the easy part of the game, too. Whatever will I do if I run out of those precious continues? There is a solution. Don't worry about that. That's what they're supposed to do. Jump towards you immediately. And fail. So when they do what they're supposed to do, I take much less damage. So up here, through the ghost path. I guess I could have gone down this time, but... The down path is just a sewer level. If you want an easy time, stay on the upper path the entire time. I think it's actually a reward for performing the platforming well is you get to stay on the easy path. But, then you miss the ghouler. And his ghouls. That's when the uh, monsters stack up and absorb one another's hits. They shield each other from damage. Stack them all up. And keep Ghouler from singing his beautiful song. And he's dead. Didn't even get to resurrect some of his ghouls. I believe from there you can go up again, but uh, that just puts you on a path to another obnoxious boar worm section. Down here we have ghosts and dogs teaming up. And they combo well with one another. This could be a very annoying room. The hitbox on the ghost skulls makes absolutely no sense. And uh, as a result, I've deceased. I guess we'll stick with the upper path. I believe in the Let's Play, I intentionally game over here. So as to show off every single path, because this is a absurdly complicated level. Once we get uh, to new territory this time, I will save state. So we don't need to see the hand room again. You know all about the hands. I haven't had the floor slide me into the pit. Which is good. The lower path. Pretty easy to start with. But we don't get a 2x4 this time, so we actually have to walk into the enemy's hitbox and attack them with pretty careful timing. And I believe you can ascend again if you go past that ladder. So many monsters. Okay. He's got no allies, and he's dead. Problem solved. Let's look at our options. Yeah, we can go up here. 
I'm gonna die in the basement. I'm familiar with Deadhead Fred. And I have it on my PSP emulator. And I intend to play it someday. I mean, I have played a chunk of it. Just I haven't showed any of it off. But it's an amusing horror-themed game. I typically don't play horror games, actually. This is not a horror game. This is a horror-themed game. This is an action game. Rick is far too powerful to be a horror protagonist because he's not a victim. He's modeled after the killer in a famous horror series. Yeah, I believe we're in business. An intelligible voice clip. Oh, and immediately impaled by a demon who was once Jennifer. No problem. They let us get right back to work. This boss is very easy to manipulate. You could almost imagine. Jennifer is trying not to kill us. But we'll try and help her. The only way we know how. All you have is your fists. Pops will never help you. Or every problem looks like a nail or something. Yeah, these days some people would be more into this version of Jennifer. Stay right about here and we will manipulate Jennifer's AI at this point. So the short hops will never result in her impaling me. And indeed, she's down. And disintegrates. And then a monster comes in and rubs our bald head to reassure us and get us back on track. So we jump down the gross pit, ready to fight little Mercury Gremlins. So this is the hardest and worst level in the whole game. It's extremely random. These ovum can spawn in basically any location. We'll do so with increasing frequency as we go on. I started out with less than full HP, so I was kind of screwed to begin with. But this is where the arcade game gets your quarters. The game's not over, but you feel like you're close to the end because you just fought Jennifer. So you're invested. And you are going to keep spending those quarters. And this level is going to take as many quarters as you got. There's our boss. That is what is creating... The Blighted Ovum. And it has 10 trillion HP, so when we get there, we're gonna have to punch it for a very long time. But yeah, Dr. West somehow created... ...a, like, monster-spawning womb... ...inside its house. That is how it became the Splatter House. None of the future games really explore this particular theme of inanimate otherworldly motherhood. Perhaps it was too disturbing 
even for the 2010 game. Once they hatch, they become much more dangerous. Look at how many there are. This is ridiculous. I hate this level. <laughs> ah, and their hitboxes are absolute nonsense. This is a level where they really should have provided you with a weapon. Because our hitboxes are also nonsense. Like, the attacks we do are frequently a millimeter away. When it looks like they should be connecting. But they aren't. The slide kick is useful because it is not beholden to only hitting one enemy, like the punch is. If you slide kick, you go through like four enemies, all four of them die. Or at least take damage. But frequently they will take multiple hits of damage. As the slide passes through their hitbox. It's a good move, and it is much easier to perform on this version than on the arcade version. And there's a blurb in the instruction manual informing you how to do it. I don't believe the arcade game had such information available to you. Just had to get lucky. Okay, I got hugged. Yeah, I'm way too surrounded. Sometimes when you get to the heart, you will get lucky, and it won't spawn a trillion little eggs. And sometimes it will. In the latter instance, I have never survived. And we just saw it. So, I figure... If I'm in good shape when I get to the end of this, I will save state as well. Because this is a very, very long and tedious segment. Very random, very unpleasant. Not very fun. The Turbo Graphics version provides you with more resources, and that you have a higher health cap, and I believe more lives per credit, something like that. Okay. I like these odds. I like them better a second ago. See if this is salvageable. Salvageable. Okay, they're immediately all over my case. Here. I'm in control again. But look at how many there are. I am getting overwhelmed, but not lethally yet. I already... Look at how many hits this takes. This is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But it died. Obnoxious fight. You already got my money. This is the Turbo Graphics version. It's on the home console. Shave off some of that HP. And on to the obstacle course. Nothing in this level can be killed except the final boss, so. Just gotta remember the exact location of absolutely everything. And react in advance. Reaction times will not cut it. Could have got through that damageless. Another bit of censorship. 
Captain Mozzarella's grave used to be a cross. No crosses allowed, though. You'd think it would be more offensive that games deemed it, like, illegal to even depict a cross. Equating crosses to, like, nudity and profanity. Nothing more obscene than a cross, according to early 90s, late 80s video games. And for some reason, the Christians tended to agree. Ah, too close. To the goo hand. Captain Mozzarella also has a tremendous amount of HP. So you gotta be somewhat careful. But he's very random. So you do want to get there with as much HP as possible. Ideally, all of it. Since this segment is so scripted. Ideally, all of it. The rocks that fall down will hurt you, and their location is completely random, which is often very unfair to the player. Sometimes it'll cause you to completely miss a cycle where you could potentially damage the boss. Other times it'll just be, like, guaranteed to hit you. Neither of those was the case this time. We saw a little bit of it there. The hands you can hopscotch indefinitely. Good thing, too, is they will start to appear during the fight, and then I got rained on by rocks. Was that our last credit? Nope, this is our last credit before a legitimate game over. But a legitimate game over is not that big a deal, actually. Made it over the double log. Impressive. Rick should try it for the Olympics after this. There we go. Full HP. Ready for the boss. As ready as I can possibly be. And he already rocked my world. That'll happen. You do get to see the hands at the very bottom of the screen, just above the health bar. So that's at least fair. You'll know where they're coming. Position yourself appropriately. The rocks, however, have been incredibly unfair thus far. I'm a little over eager. Get rid of them. Frankly, the rocks are like an embarrassment. They're terrible design. After all the stuff we've seen our character do, all the enemies we've bested, tiny little pebbles are what's going to kill us. Unfortunately so. Yeah. Bonked in the head by Pebbles once again. So now... We save state after we complete the logs. Because this is a luck-based fight. But it is very clearly Final Boss-esque. So if you made it through the womb... You are now so deep in sunk cost fallacy that uh, you are going to beat this game. And it's more reasonable to save scum this one compared to the womb. Because they give you a very short cutscene, perfect for save scumming. It's like they knew save states would be a thing decades later. Built the game around it. Very forward thinking, these Splatterhouse devs. 
We're gonna see very soon, actually, how not forward-thinking they were. They actually made a lot of mistakes that one would never make again on the first game in a series like this. This might be it if the rocks obey. There he goes. Big Head is down. It is believed that Head belongs to Dr. West, who hasn't been seen because he's dead after experimenting on himself. But that has never been confirmed by the series lore. Oh, I should have warned you that the screen flash would be bad. Sorry about that. It's already over, though. And notice that the background looks very much like that of the first level of Splatterhouse 2, which is a cool detail. Now, the mask explodes. The house burns down. There is no more Splatterhouse. There is no more Terror Mask. There is no more Jennifer. The only survivor of this game is Rick. At the end of the first Splatterhouse game, they destroyed every single piece of lore in the game. Like they didn't even want it to be a franchise. It's possible they thought it was so violent that they would never have a chance to make anything like this ever again. So they literally burned it all to the ground afterwards. But, uh... Of all the things they ripped off from Friday the 13th, they chose not to rip off the fact that every single game ends on a cliffhanger so that you can pump out endless sequels the way the people want. It's like they never even saw Friday the 13th before stealing the mask. Maybe they just saw the cover of the VHS box. I know that's all I saw in the early 90s, so... Maybe they can't be blamed. Maybe they were chickens. Tragically, there would never be another Splatterhouse. No Splatterhouse 2, no Wampaka Graffiti, not even a 2010 remake. 22 years after this game originally came out. Clearly they just did not have that sort of vision when they put this out, that it would last for 22 more years and have an enduring legacy to this day. Bring it back Splatterhouse now. Hashtag re-reboot. I honestly thought there would be a shocking twist at the end. Just to give us something. A hand popping out of the ground. A scream, somehow, even though everyone's dead. Tragic. The real tragedy is the lack of franchise potential. Just ask capitalism. Actually, the real tragedy is it won't let me out of the screen. I just pressed every button and it changed the volume and that's it. So, let's reset it once again, since I know how to do that now. Splatterhouse. Right now I'm holding the select button for a while. Not long enough before the demo starts. There. This version has a hard mode. I'm not going to play hard mode right now, but uh, it might be worth revisiting at some point. Because it doubles the enemy HP. It adds more enemies. So it is a different experience to the game. It's a Kaizo hack. A Splatterhouse 1. To make up for the fact that the base game, without hard mode, is slightly easier. But Splatterhouse is still a hard game. I'm not disappointed by my experience difficulty-wise. I'm not disappointed by anything related to Splatterhouse. I love this game. And any excuse to maybe play it again in the future. For now, though. Here's the stage select. This was my, uh... 
a uh, safety net were I to have truly game overed. And within the stage select is the sound test. What's a great ending song? <laughs> uh, let's have a nice stressful ending to Splatterhouse. I will undoubtedly revisit this series again. Gotta milk it for all it's worth. Plus, it actually makes me a little bit happy to see it again. So, hope you've enjoyed this revisit of the TurboGrafx version. See you again eventually for more Splatterhouse.